The 90s was a golden era for TV, especially for superhero shows. This decade saw special effects stepping up their game, which added that extra zing to our TV screens. Of course, we had some classic heroes like Hercules, Flash, and Superboy hitting the screens, but we also got the privilege to witness some of the more obscure ones like Nightman, Big Bad Beetleborgs, and Masked Rider. Unfortunately, not all of these shows received the love and respect that they deserved, but no more. In this video, we will explore the 11 forgotten 90s live-action superhero TV shows that were kind of ahead of their time. Why? Because it's important that these shows were introduced to our younger audiences and reintroduced to the senior fellows. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. What are you? What are you? Nightman, 1997. Nightman revolved around Johnny Domino, a San Francisco jazz musician turned accidental superhero. The guy gets struck by lightning in a wacky cable car mishap, and the accident gives him the power to sniff out evil with his mind, in addition to a few other powers. The catch is that the dude can't catch a wink of sleep anymore. But hey, who needs sleep when you've got a sleek, blue-caped, bulletproof bodysuit that's loaded with cool tricks like flying, going invisible, and seeing in the dark through a red lens? Plus, it shoots lasers. So, what do you do with all these things? Well, of course, you fight crime. This live-action series was inspired by the pages of Malibu Comics' Nightman. Later, Malibu was overtaken by Marvel Comics. Anyway, Nightman remained Glenn Larson's brainchild. And honestly, it was quite a fun show. We've got a musician with insane auditory powers playing superhero. And how often do you see that? Sure, the plot might get a bit shaky at times, but it's a fun, cheesy romp through superhero cliches with gadgets that'll make you grin. Nightman doesn't try to be Batman, even if he treads similar ground. And that's cool. He's his own kind of night hero, without going all grim and broody. Despite its novelty, Nightman didn't quite hit the high notes with audiences and soon saw a dip in ratings. A big oopsie was straying from the original comic, which proves you can't totally wing it when you're basing a show on a comic. Yet for all the sci-fi buffs out there, this show's got its charms. It stays true to what it is and does not go all overreaching, keeping it real with a mix of superhero shenanigans and childlike wonder. Vengeance. Nothing like a little death to breathe a little life. The Crow, Stairway to Heaven, 1998 through 1999. The TV series that tried to step into the big boots of the 1994 cult classic film The Crow. Based on the same named comic series, this show revives Eric Draven, a rock musician who's back from the dead, with Mark DeCascos filling in for Brandon Lee, whose untimely death shocked Hollywood back in the day. As far as the premise is concerned, Eric's been murdered, and a year later, he's back with some supernatural help from a mystical spirit crow. He's looking for revenge and, you know, a bit of redemption. Now, following Brandon Lee's tragic accident during the film's production, replacing him was no easy feat. Discassos came in, and the guy proved to be more than Lee's lookalike. He nailed some of Lee's mannerisms, too. He has that vibe, and honestly, he did a solid job in the role. The Crow Stairway to Heaven is truly a time capsule of the late 90s, and DeCascos brings heart and a light touch to Eric Draven, especially when he's in full crow mode. And man, can he fight! The action scenes where he shows off his martial arts skills chops are still considered great. It's a shame DeCascos didn't skyrocket to mega fame, but hey, his roles in films like John Wick 3 do him some justice that he deserves. Having said that, the show couldn't quite match the original movie's dark, gothic aesthetic. Too much sunshine, not enough of that brooding nighttime. Filmed in Vancouver, it managed to capture some moodiness at least. Plot-wise, it was rather grey. Some storylines are more hit than miss. Despite the occasional plot hiccup, The Crow Stairway to Heaven had its charm. Eric Draven, instead of finding peace after avenging his and Shelley's deaths, sticks around to fight more bad guys. It's a stretch, but somehow the show makes it work as a piece of escapism. In short, the show might not soar as high as the original, but it's got its moments and is worth a watch for anyone into The Crow Saga. <laughs> Baby games with big fat beats on board. Big bad beats on board.
Big Bad Beetleborgs, 1996 through 1998. Big Bad Beetleborgs, a 90s show born in the wake of the mighty Morphin Power Rangers craze, was something of a breath of fresh air in the superhero genre. Produced by Sabin Entertainment, the same company behind Power Rangers, Beetleborgs infused sitcom humor into its storyline while also borrowing fight scenes from a Japanese series similar to its predecessor. The show's run was brief, lasting just two seasons, primarily due to running out of the Japanese footage it relied on. Set in Charterville, the plot revolves around three friends, Drew McCormick, his sister Joe, and Roland Williams. Their adventure begins in the spooky Hillhurst Mansion, where they release Flabber, a friendly phasm, after a dare goes awry. Grateful, Flabber grants them a wish, and they choose to become their favorite comic book heroes, the Big Bad Beetleborgs. This transformation, however, also brings their comic book foes, the Magnivores, led by Vexor, to life. Roland's family, who run a comic book shop, become part of the narrative, too. A significant storyline is the creation of Shadowborg by Vexor. This formidable foe challenges the Beetleborgs and temporarily strips them of their powers. To counter this, they enlist a temporary Beetleborg, White Blaster Beetleborg. After Shadowborg's defeat, Josh relinquishes his powers. The Beetleborgs also collaborate with their comics creator, Art Fortunes, to develop new powers and strategies. In the first season climax, the Magnivores unleash Nukus, a villain from Art Fortunes' sketches. Nukus aids the Magnivores by launching severe attacks on the city and creating Borg Slayer, a monster conglomerate. However, Nukus plans to eliminate the Magnivores. He informs Trip and Van, two characters attempting to escape the chaos, how to defeat Borg Slayer, and they relay this to the Beetleborgs. The successful destruction of Borg Slayer results in the Magnivores being banished back into the comic world. The Flash, 1990 through 1991. Before Grant Gustin and Ezra Miller donned the Flash's suit, John Wesley Shipp lays the trail as Barry Allen in the early 90s series The Flash. Playing a forensic scientist for the Central City Police, Shipp's Allen transforms into the speedster superhero following a lightning strike and a chemical spill. With his newfound powers, he assumes the mantle of The Flash, juggling crime fighting and his personal life, all while keeping his identity a secret from colleagues, his boss, Lieutenant Garfield, and his best friend Julio Mendez. Dr. Tina McGee from Star Labs becomes an ally, aiding Barry in his superhero journey and studying his powers. The series echoed Tim Burton's 1989 Batman in many aspects, including Danny Elfman's musical contribution and the adoption of a darker, more serious tone and costume design. Despite these parallels, The Flash didn't replicate Batman's triumph and was cancelled after just one season. However, this iteration of The Flash has not faded into obscurity. The 2014 Flash series, starring Grant Gustin pays homage to its 90s predecessor with multiple references. John Wesley Shipp's legacy in the Flash universe is further honored by his guest appearance in the newer series, bridging the gap between the two adaptions. Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, 1993 through 1997. Post the lackluster Superman 4 in 1987, The Man of Steel took a break, only to soar back in 1993 with Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. This TV series put a spotlight on Dean Cain's Superman, chronicling his journey from arriving in Metropolis and donning his iconic suit to resuming his intense romance with Lois Lane and his ongoing face-off with Lex Luthor. Despite a strong start and critical acclaim, particularly for Kane's performance, Lois and Clark saw its viewership dip, leading to the show's cancellation after four seasons, scrapping the initial plan for a fifth. The show kicks off with Jonathan and Martha Kent discovering baby Cal L in 1966, raising him as Clark Jerome Kent. Fast forward 27 years, and Clark leaves Smallville for a reporter job at the Daily Planet in Metropolis. Here he meets characters like photographer Jimmy Olsen and gossip colonist Cat Grant. Metropolis, violent but dangerous, forces Clark to adopt the Superman persona to use his powers without risking exposure. At the Daily Planet, Clark is teamed up with Lois Lane, the star reporter. While Clark is smitten with Lois, she's captivated by Superman, underestimating Clark. Lois's knack for unearthing scandals often lands her in trouble, queuing Superman's rescues. Clark learns about his Kryptonian heritage through a hologram-projecting globe, understanding he wasn't abandoned but saved from his doomed planet. Meanwhile, Superman becomes a thorn in the side of Lex Luthor, a corrupt metropolis mogul, setting up a complex hero villain dynamic. Three, but you will be on the
VR Troopers, 1994 through 1996. Capitalizing on the success of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Sabin Entertainment launched VR Troopers, a show that blended the Power Rangers concept with the 90s craze for virtual reality. This series, a close cousin to the Power Rangers, spanned two seasons and faced the same issue as Big Bad Beetleborgs, the depletion of Japanese footage it relied upon. Set in the fictional town of Cross World City, California, VR Troopers revolves around three teens, Ryan Steele, Caitlin Starr, and J.B. Reese. They're not just high schoolers, but also instructors at Tao's Dojo. Ryan is a martial arts enthusiast, JB is tech savvy, and Caitlin is a photographer and aspiring journalist for the Underground Voice Daily. Their adventure kicks off when Ryan's search for his missing father leads them to a secret lab. There they learn from Professor Horatio Hart, a digital entity and a friend of Ryan's father, about a parallel virtual reality realm threatened by mutants led by Grimlord, who also exists in the real world as billionaire Carl Zichter. Tasked with defending both realities, Ryan, Caitlin, and JB are equipped with armored suits loaded with high-tech firepower, including a turbo cycle, techno bazooka, and a sky base. They are supported by characters like Jeb, Ryan's dog who gains the ability to speak, Woody Stalker, Caitlin's eccentric boss, Percy Rooney, Caitlin's clumsy rival, and Tao, the wise sensei and family friend. The second season brought some changes. Ryan's father is found and leads to aid government VR research, which leads to Ryan receiving new armor and upgraded powers. Grimlord shifts his base from a dungeon to a spacecraft, leading to a shift in the show's visuals and the introduction of new villains like Oraclon, Despera, and the Ultra Skugs. Mantis, 1994 through 1995. Dr. Miles Hawkins, a wealthy African-American scientist, transforms adversity into strength in the superhero show Mantis after a police sniper's bullet leaves him paralyzed while saving a child. Hawkins loses his legal battle against the police department. Undeterred, he creates an advanced exoskeleton, the mechanically augmented neurotransmitter interactive system or Mantis, restoring his ability to walk and granting him superhuman abilities. As the Mantis, Hawkins fights crime with an array of high-tech tools. His riches fund the Sea Pod, an underwater lab, and the Chrysalis, a versatile vehicle capable of flying and swimming. His suit, as a tribute to his past paralysis, can fire paralyzing darts. Despite its innovative concept and diverse cast, Mantis faced challenges. Critics and fans have attributed its cancellation to creative disagreements and alleged racial biases. The show's original focus on social issues, particularly racism, was diluted over time in favor of more fantastical elements. The cast's ethnic makeup also shifted, leading to speculations about attempts to appeal to a broader, predominantly white audience. Having said that, this show, blending the intellectual depth of Batman, the resilience of Daredevil, and the cultural significance of Black Panther, was arguably ahead of its time, yet it couldn't withstand the tides of change in the television landscape. Swamp Thing, 1990 through 1993. Swamp Thing, based on the DC Comics character, was released in the 90s as a TV series with a more serious tone than its 1980s film predecessors. The show, starring Dick Durock as the titular plant humanoid hero, became a hit on the USA Network, praised especially for its realistic and fearsome costume design, despite restricting Durock's movements in action scenes. Lasting three seasons, it has since cultivated a cult following, and there's a buzz about Swamp Thing's return in James Gunn is DC Studios' revamp. The series introduced the Kip family in a new rendition of Anton Arcane, portrayed by Mark Lindsay Chapman. Initially targeting a younger demographic with the character Jim Kip, played by Jess Ziegler, the show later reverted to its darker roots. This shift was followed by the abrupt and controversial write-out of Jim Kip, who was kidnapped by a child-stealing ring linked to Arcane and then mysteriously disappeared from the storyline. The subsequent seasons worked to tie up loose ends, including Jim Kip's fate, resolved off-camera with his mother, Tressa, eventually finding and sending him to live with his father. The show delved deeper into Alec Holland's struggle as Swamp Thing, focusing on his quest for a cure and his unrequited love for Dr. Anne Fisk. Additionally, these seasons explored Dr. Arcane's complex madness, attempting to unravel the roots of his evil nature.
Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, 1995 through 1999. Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, starring Kevin Sorbo, brought the iconic Greek hero to life in a show that blended fantasy, action, and a touch of humor. Set in an anachronistic ancient Greece, it follows Hercules and his friend Aeolus on adventures battling everything from mythical monsters to capricious gods. The show was known for its playful jabs at modern themes and enjoyed a successful six-season run. In fact, it even became the world's top-rated syndicated TV series at one point. The series was a mix of Greek, Oriental, Egyptian, and medieval elements, and featured Robert Trevor as Salmoneus, Hercules' other sidekick. Its plots typically revolved around Hercules and Aeolus rescuing villages from various threats with a good dose of comedy and contemporary references thrown in. Initially, Hercules' main adversary was Hera, the goddess queen seeking revenge for Zeus' infidelity. As the show evolved, Eris, Hercules' half-brother and the god of war, became the central villain. He was later replaced by the super evil god to Hawk. These challenges led Hercules on journeys across diverse lands like Sumeria and Norseland. Despite Zeus being depicted as a neglectful father, the series shows a complex relationship between him and Hercules. In fact, Zeus's affection for his son is evident, and he often helps Hercules in troublesome situations. Hercules, in turn, supports Zeus when needed, ultimately reconciling and accepting his father, closing their tumultuous father-son saga. Superboy TV series 1988 through 1992. Superboy, later known as The Adventures of Superboy, was a unique exploration of the college life of Cal L and explored his initial superhero escapades and his rivalry with Lex Luthor. The show was set at the fictional Shuster University in Siegelville, Florida, and took viewers through Clark Kent's early journalism endeavors at the college paper, The Shuster Herald. Filmed at the University of Central Florida, it creatively transformed the campus to resemble the coastal Siegelville. The series holds the distinction of being the first weekly TV show produced at Disney MGM Studios, later shifting to Universal Studios Florida. Its initial two seasons maintained a consistent theme, but the story took a darker, more film-noir turn in seasons three and four. Actor changes added behind-the-scenes drama, with John Newton, the original Superboy, being replaced by Gerard Christopher. Despite this shakeup, the show maintained strong ratings. The storytelling evolved with new writers and complex multi-part plots, although some episodes had a formula feel. Villain portrayals varied, some appearing budget-constrained, but the show successfully introduced iconic antagonists to a new generation. It even drew inspiration from darker cinematic influences, like the 1989 Batman movie. Masked Rider, 1995. Masked Rider kick starts with Prince Dex, an Edenite rebel, narrowly escaping the Plague Patrol and fleeting to Earth. His mission was to thwart his tyrannical uncle, Count Dragon, who usurped power from Dex's grandfather, King Lexian, on their home planet, Edenoi. King Lexian had bestowed upon Dex the mysterious Masked Rider powers, a coveted ability that Dragon seeks for himself. Crash landing in a massive crater on Earth, Dex is taken in by the Stewards, a diverse family with Hal and his adopted daughter, Ma. Ollie, Hal's wife Barbara, and their adopted African-American son Alby. Dex's unexpected addition to the family goes unquestioned in their town Leewood. As the masked rider, he defends Leewood from Dragon and his menacing insectivores. Edenoi, interestingly, intersects with the Power Rangers universe as Alpha 5's birthplace, though the continuity between the two series is a bit hazy. In a deviation from the televised story, the title sequence shows a different scene of Dex receiving his powers from King Lexian, hinting at remnants from the the original pilot. Dex's superhero persona evolves with upgrades like Masked Rider Super Gold with a laser gun, the Ecto Ray, and Masked Rider Super Blue, which boasts liquefied teleportation and the powerful Blue Saber. Unique to Edenites, who evolved from insects, is their telepathic prowess, channeled through a gem on their forehead, the Mind Crystal. This gem, usually concealed but visible under stress, aids in focusing mental energy and creating shared mental imagery. Dex uses his knowledge to cleanse Leewood's rivers using solar-powered laser Lasers. Accompanying Dex on Earth is Furbus, a furry bear duck-like creature. Initially hidden due to Hal's allergies, Furbus eventually becomes known to the whole family. Dex's eloquence and literal interpretation of language provide a comedic twist. Advised by Molly and Abby to learn colloquial speech from TV, he amusingly mimics exactly what he hears, leading to some humorous misunderstandings. So yeah, that was all in this one. If you have any suggestions or additional entries to the list, you know where to comment.